Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode. The title is Opening the Wings of Vision. And so I thought of first titling it Opening the Wings of Your Vision. But then I realized vision, after some point, doesn't have an ideological owner and is in the domain or in the territory of an energetic being. Opening the wings of vision, the inspiration for this uh, title, it actually came from a poem from Rumi, a sentence from his poetic works, where he says, you were born with wings, why prefer to crawl through life? And so that quote made me kind of visualize it as if, if I had been born with, let's say, wings, you know, like in the pic you see in the picture, like imagine you were born with angel wings and you're crawling under a table. Like you have the ability to fly above the trees, but you're crawling under a table. <coughs> so Romy says, you were born with wings, why prefer to crawl through life? That means when you are able to do something, why not do it? The same way this sentence has a value for me, or I can say in another way it has a value for me. Is that we can build an advanced civilization. That's the wings. That's the potential. What we're choosing to crawl through life. So I thought about human beings imagine you see human beings and you don't think we're just some feeble small ant like you know creaturehood you think of every human being as having two sorts of access to the world every human being, every creature to be honest not every creature but i could say <clears throat> most conscious uh objective oriented creatures If we consider a personal meaning to life and an impersonal meaning to life, most people, they tend to run their lives uh, mainly with their personality being the center, <coughs> uh, being the central filter, let's say, of their, who they are. There is a personal meaning and there is an impersonal meaning. The personal meaning is found when you act as an individual. The collective meaning is found as you act as a collective. What does that mean? That means you have two sorts of value as a human being. One for yourself, as you are the pilot of your own experiencer, but you're also a passenger of existence. This is very crucial. <clears throat> this ability to kind of, again, um, to engage the roomy poetry you're born with wings but you're crawling in life so you have an impersonal meaning a meaning that is way beyond you little old you the idea of you you know and there's a meaning that is only you you know it's like what man has two ways of looking at the universe spelling the universe you know the word universe you know u-n-i-v-e-r-s-e or y-o-u <laughs> N-I-V-E-R-S-E Universe, your universe You see, I am right now looking at this world But I can't uh, ignore how its meaning is arising from me You know, it's as if we are a lens that the light is passing through <clears throat> And on the other side of the lens, it becomes a subject There was a time that I, I mean, I, I noticed that when I was younger, I would get upset when things, uh, when my inner realms were rejected by the outer realms.
But once you see there is more than your problem, people suffer when they feel their problems don't change. Did you know this? If you got sick and instantly you healed, where is the problem? Where is the suffering? Sometimes I feel suffering is an analysis. <clears throat> it is. It is at. It is at, at uh, most instantly an observation. You know, I. It's astonishing. In this life, I can't tell you from the beginning of my life how many life forms I've seen. For example, insects, animals, even you know, uh, picking a flower from a garden. All this is, in some sense, there is a huge disconnect component to life and a connection point. Right now, we're individual creatures, so the meaning of life is connect. You know, it's like when else are we going to be eight billion creatures on a sphere in the middle of nowhere? You know. <clears throat> What's fascinating is most people don't realize, and it's very complex to realize this in, in this world. I feel that it happens once. And it makes me wonder why many people, many great minds on this planet hold back. You see, there was a time I felt that genius could exist in this world, but maybe the circumstance doesn't invite it. Maybe we have built a civilization that shuns its own genius, that shuns its own freedom to see different angles. You know? By the way, anybody listening to these talks, um, I would kindly request from you to <clears throat> not impose to, um, you see, I'm not speaking as uh, a, a religious person, secular person, spiritual person, or a philosophical oriented person. I am speaking, you know? And when we can tell the difference, when we can tell the difference from the, <clears throat> I'm going to say claymation, because it, it's literally the inner realms. <laughs> what if your wings were open? What if you right now were the most able human being on this planet? And let us say only you knew that. Whose responsibility would it be to show that ability to the world? People feel life is just anything. I feel that the advanced, an advanced civilization, advanced human being, it also has an advanced relationship with organization and chaos. Do you see when you look at civilization, sure, you could put the stories, the emotions, the name, but names, but when you strip away the language, you just see existential events that simulate bubbles and spheres of experience in accordance to the moment they go. You see, I am I walk in a different vision than any ideological system. Simply because language for me is not the true colors of the world. What does that mean? That means the master painter knows that the canvas is empty before a single drop of ink is on it. And that awareness to the empty canvas is very similar, the same awareness a painter has to an empty canvas, is very similar to how you as a human being can navigate your inner realms, your mind. Your mind is, is like um, um, uh, the infusion of an uh, invisible uh, office space. <laughs> <laughs> It's the infusion of an invisible office space <laughs> with law, 
this law. Many people don't know, but honor is staying true to your own laws. You see, we look at a civilization, we look at societies around the world, you know, we see environments with a certain authority, they have rules and regulation, and throughout this world, of course, there's so much legislation. You know, there's so many ways that the world has been uh, solidified into an abstract meaning because an idea is not physical. You think me talking to you right now, I can uh, pick up the idea of meme, I can hold my ego in my hand and give and show it to you? The ego is evocational. Your ego is the aftermath of the engagement of your attention with phenomena into a story. That means when attention reflects into a story. This is a new idea, guys. I feel light enter our eyes and light what uh, the light enters our eyes and like a mirror that <clears throat> imagine a mirror that transformed the light that hit it you know the quality of it the texture you know uh, in some of my dreams, I, I've had a lot of dreams where I've died in the dreams. A lot. I mean, I, I could say maybe like four or five. <clears throat> in these dreams that I perceive my own deconstruction, that means the witnessing of death is not death. What I mean by that is, is not in a physical sense, not like someone dying and observing themselves on a deathbed. I mean, in the sense that this reality has its entrance and it also has its exit. And many human beings enter the entrance and they, don't, they try to ignore or avoid the exit and not even fathom it. Fear is, is um, uh, the greatest distraction known to man. Do you know that means if you want someone not to look somewhere, make them fear going there, you know? You want to make someone listen, make them fear the consequence, you know? There, there's a saying by Sun Tzu in The Art of War, he says, um, the, thus, the expert in battle uh, is not, uh, uh, thus the expert in battle moves the enemy and is not moved by him. What does that mean? That means consciousness, it, life moves in your consciousness. You move life. You are the movement of life. <laughs> You know, it's like, a, you'll find few people disagreeing with that. It's like, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely moving and I'm alive. So, yeah, I, I can see myself as a movement of life. <laughs> For me, nature is here first. Language came left. Oh. Nature, because it's here first, it is older. It has, like, it's the older brother of language, nature. I can't tell you everything comes down to an existential level, but once it's at that existential level, it has nowhere to go. That means when the attention gets bored with existence, it projects itself into multidimensional experience. When it gets bored with multidimensional uh, experience, it projects itself into singular existence. And it's an oscillation. Right now, we have an individual comprehension of our species. You know, we're not even that honorable in the sense that feeling as if proud of our species. People are feeling proud of their nations, you know, but they're not feeling proud of their planet. You know, it, it becomes ridiculous after some point that we have colored the face of Gaia. We have colored the face of this earth. We have limited the resource allocation to, to borders, not realizing that instead of fighting over a two-dimensional plane, if all the human beings on earth were smart, they would build sky cities. I'm telling you, the future is in the sky, literally. <laughs> <clears throat> so to consider that uh, the wings of a being is their ability, and vision is the direction that ability go, 
that, that ability can go. To open the wings of vision means to be the spontaneous effort. You see, I in my youth, um, of course, I was in a theocratical society, and so I was acquainted. I was introduced to the idea of religion and metaphysics at an early age. It was very strange. It was as if like the moment that I considered religion, it, it's like I had a I had a certain clear understanding of what the religious algorithm was you know what the scientific algorithm was and what the spiritual algorithm implied you see spirituality has nothing to say really trust me like there's some many people may like these videos but they're hundred percent they are mystics and wiser eyes in the world who are looking at me giving these talks and it's like what is this kid doing you know <laughs> And to be honest, I, I would have no reason to speak because the solution of this planet, even though I'm giving talks, is not per se just vocal. I'm giving talks now because there's a lot of physical action. There's little um, immaterial uh, observance uh, or there is little observance of action. You see, most people, they want to just go with the program. They just want to get through. You know, I remember um, uh, my high school uh, in Canada, um, there was this trip that we went to this um, private school in Connecticut. It was this very strange trip, like a rare occasion the school had. And so the, the school would take you to Connecticut. And so we went to America in Connecticut. There was this next level like I have never seen in my life a school, uh, a high school like this, you know, it was like this very, um, very, you know, upper echelon, upper class kind of uh, boarding school in America where it was like one week. <laughs> we were like, we were like peasants who had been allowed inside the kingdom. <laughs> for, for, a couple we, for a couple weeks we went there, but we, I, we stayed in the rooms of the people there. It was a group, a group of people went. And um, um, they had this thing, they had this dance thing. They had this rodeo da dance event, you know? And everyone there was with, um, you can say their counterpart. What I mean is, is, is that it was as if like, um, mainly nobody was walking alone, but in that rodeo thing, <laughs> that rodeo thing what ends up happening guys i'll never forget this it was such an intense situation so think of it this way we've gone to this board uh private this i don't know private school kind of uh in connecticut this next level like next level expensive private school in connecticut where it's like i don't know like a hundred thousand dollars i was like what the fuck <laughs> you know <clears throat> and uh it was this really next level, anyways, school, but in it, I remember they had this, um, I'm going to tell you, okay, I'm, I'm infusing too much, too much imagery here. There was a situation where people went to participate in this group, old school event dance thing in that private school. And what would happen is the girls would run up to the guys to find a partner, you know, while before the song ended. You know, and there was this one guy, this one kid in the whole school. That means, imagine these are all kids who their parents have paid a hundred thousand dollars for for these kids to be there. You know, and there was this one kid that was there, and uh, here's the thing: it was mob mentality hatred. I saw mob mentality hatred towards this kid. You know, and. Uh, I don't know, guys. To be honest, I can't explain the events well. But uh, I'm just saying, it was as if like there was a lot of potential, but nothing was being done. And a lot of life, people are just staring at it as it passes them by. I feel, you know, not realizing that the stage is you're on the stage once. And
So William says, do you ever feel you're throwing your pearls to swine? Um, no, because these are not pearls. These are baby steps for an advanced civilization to just uh, get the engine running. That means even, I, I feel it's not in, in words. Do you know what I mean? The pearl is never in words. That pearl where William in the chat section you say, that pearl, you're using that from a Christian context, uh, but the idea of the pearl as, 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 as a sort of uh, attention, let me tell you no, because I realize the future will be ton, thousand times, so many times more advanced than this. You know? So much more advanced. And there are no pearls. Rumi has this, and let me tell you what I mean by that. Rumi has this quote. He says, before death takes away all that you're given, give away all there is to give. These pearls, even if people listen to me and they think I'm giving pearls to swine, let me tell you, these are not my pearls. This is nature just happening in this way so far. Because the human being is not a mathematical equation where you just, uh, uh, you found a certain value and that's it. You're done. You know, you found a certain, a certain code of linguistic truth entered your mind and, oh, you're done. Good job, human being. You've received the ultimate. It's a system. It's, it's, a, it's awakening that it is uh, an event. It's not a belief. It's not an idea. It is not a conceptual truth. It is an event. The concept has as much value as it becomes the fingertip pointing to the left. <clears throat> because these are not pearls. Let me tell you, the real pearl is when your mind moves before the idea of you. I would consider that. Yes, William, I, I, I see your comment. Yeah, yeah, I understand. I understand what you meant. I'm just saying that. It's just you're thinking there are pearls because you're thinking one step ahead. I'm telling you, think hundred steps ahead. You'll see this is no pearl. This is no pearl. You think I'm giving pearls here? Let me tell you what I mean by that. Uh, I feel I am just asking. the bewildered beast to look at itself again regardless of how true you feel in this life because it's a performance you'll see it one day you'll feel uh, it's not that you're an actor the whole manifestation is an actor you will see how energy is uh, uh, the language of nature uh, communicated through us. As far as I'm concerned, uh, the atoms and the particles uh, that we are made of, uh, they are the alphabet. You see an alphabet, it's not enough just for an alphabet to exist. There has to be the user of language. There has to be a mover, an intelligent mover. That means we have legs, we can move in the environment. If the person your attention can move beyond ideology. That's because you are in a bed, in, in, in a, uh, you know, it's, it's like not being in shallow water, like being, you know, your knees are up to the beach, uh, your knees are up to the water by the beach. And so you think you're drowning your knees, your knees are up to the water only, you know, but, uh, you, you feel you're drowning, you know? So it becomes, um, in, you know, there's many truths, experiential truths that exist, ex experience, like uh, an attention to existence updates. Think of it this way. Um, truth and experience are like swords and they are sharpened by one another. Just like how back in the day a person would have two swords and would try to sharpen both of those swords. Like think of, I don't know, medieval times among them. You know, guys, I'll tell you, Rumi has this quote where he says, I mean, this is better to say, Rumi says, um, oh my God, what is the quote?
You know, it, it's like when I hear these birds, I don't know if people listening can hear these birds chirping in my yard. On the trees, but um, you know, it's like these bird trees, judging these bird trees is like judging, uh, is, what am I saying? Judging these bird sounds is like judging human communication. It is sound. If you see a context, the concept uh, lights up. That means if you, some some situations you might um, notice uh, the, conce the concept first, but not the context. Some situations you might access the idea through the context, then the concept. If you notice when I speak, I pilot the human team. <clears throat> that means for me, all of knowledge is either self is moving world or world is moving self. And it's the piloting in between. In altered states, in a journey like model where it's as if it's a roller coaster, where every part of the roller coaster is a different angle, you know? Which means that the past is uh, as useful as you're still in it. Isn't it fascinating? Isn't it fascinating that we are like uh, a candle uh, uh, in, in, in the hands of an unknown movement? And I'm not giving it a face, a divine agency. I'm just saying it's like nature is moving uh, candles of consciousness in the darkness of the cosmos. You know, it's very obvious, even if man didn't have a purpose, you see nature has a purpose. It's just, its purpose is not comprehensible. Its purpose is not human. There's many, there's many views in, there's, there's a lot the person can perceive in this world. But well, if they are a person, they can't perceive it. And when I say it's not a person, because I'm thinking a bit ahead, guys, I'm thinking that uh, there will come a point where philosophers will begin debating what it really means to be an individual. <clears throat> right now, being an individual means, or being a successful individual in a competitive capitalistic um, marketplace means being better. Which means Western civilization, salvation is in the making skill the valuable, most valuable resource. You see, imagine our species began becoming digitally incredible. Okay? Way more advanced than we are now. We would most likely create a perception oriented digital system. Right now, our senses go into the brain and they are processed. Man will most likely create technologies that will process the senses in multiple ways, then share, bring that processed sensory perception into his eyes. That means, don't, I, I think we're going to have ge uh, geometrical goggles in the future. An image is not like a sentence, you know? It doesn't just stop. Once an image is what is, how can it not be? I'm not talking about temporary human experience. I'm just saying the nature of the mind and how it interprets the subject.
It's just an important happening. All of life is a grand occurrence which we have opened our eyes. You know, I've used different metaphors. I've seen this whole, the whole civilization being like a giant boat in unknown waters where some parts of the boat, the one end of the boat, the, there's holes in the boat and the people on the other end of the boat is so big can't see. That means right now, there, do you know, it's, it's hilarious. It's like, can we really accept any victory? Do the victories of the, this world end? Do the successes end? What is success in this life? And the biggest question of them all, is it just an image or is it playing a part? I honestly feel the value in regards to nature it's like, it doesn't matter your name, your idea, your belief. What matters is how much you saw that you were being a human being first. You were being human. And to be human means to be a simple creature in a very complex situation. Another view I had seen, it just like the boat, was that it's like Earth is this giant blue, white, and green dragon. And every person who is born has held on to some part of this dragon. Some people have held on to underneath the dragon. They're the lower class in civilization. You know, some people have, are sitting on the top of the dragon. They are the higher class in civilization. You know, yet this dragon is endlessly flying into this unknown sky and we have held on to it. And it is human instinct that if you can identify value, you will live for it. That's the only thing that separates us. We, we have taken the concept of love uh, for granted. We have uh, fluffed it up into pictures at the back of uh, popcorn you know, boxes. You know? Love is not a shape. It is when life notices life while alive at its core. And I'm telling you, whoever you are, if you think you have some sort of strange karma, just give a shit for your world. Just, just for one day, just feel as if, okay, so my mind is being my whole moment surprisingly. So does that mean any action in my moment is actually an action I am conducting uh, on myself. Do you know what that means? That means there is a self-reflective nature. As I'm saying this talk, I'm hearing my own words. I can hear my own voice, just like how you hear my voice, but I'm also speaking and, and hearing my voice. Do you see the simultaneity of expression and reception? You know, there was a question that made me cry at first, then laugh. This was like, I don't know, I think a year ago. And you know, no, sorry, it wasn't a year ago, it was longer. But what the question was, let me tell you what the question was. The question was, who am I waiting for? That's a very good question. You right now... Who are you waiting for? Listening, who's listening to this sister within talk? What are you waiting for? What? What can you wait for? For me, th this world is, it, it's as if the light is on, the hockey puck is thrown on the ice ring and go. It's, uh, it's very effort oriented. That means it's as if we are paintbrushes that, uh, must notice the type of paintbrush they are and begin helping draw uh, uh, efforts for an advanced civilization. Because that's the only thing to play. You know, just for a second, guys, imagine, you can imagine in different ways. You can imagine, imagine there was no money. Imagine there was no concept of money. Where would civilization revert to? And imagine if we were, everybody was a billionaire. 
You know, imagine we're like it, it was like a kind of Oprah moment where this, you know, gazillionaire had come <laughs> had come to <coughs> this trillionaire had come to uh, regular people and just like Oprah at the end where Oprah in his in our show she would give cars to people. And, and imagine this trillionaire is like a billion for you and a billion dollars for you and a billion dollars for you and imagine we had eight billion billionaires. What then? What then? I am telling you, whatever you do in this life, you're gonna realize it is the greatest blessing to be part of a species. It's uh you won the lottery ticket. You're in the most your eyes have opened in the most advanced creature in this universal sector you know Rama this enlightened archetype uh, and deity <coughs> in Vedic tradition a person comes and says Rama why do we have to work so hard for enlightenment, man? Why do we have to work so hard? Like, why, why do we have to work for this? And Rama was like, you serious? <laughs> Rama says, it's a blessing to be alive as a human being. Why? Of course, this is from a context of Vedic thought. But Rama says, creatures that are less evolved than you can't ask the question. And people, uh, and uh, sorry, uh, cre uh, uh, creatures, uh, uh, dimensional beings, lesser dimensional beings, they are too savage, animal-like, violent in the program of nature to notice anything else. Beings above the, the, uh, this plane of existence, Rama is saying this to the guy, above this dimension, they have so many answers, they don't need to ask the question. It is in human life where this deity Rama was telling the dude that you have a next level opportunity to actually see what is going on in the cosmic landscape. That means don't think only man is blind. We have had many blind gods in history. Archetypes, many blind archetypes, many blind designs that felt they were everything. But let me tell you, service is the higher dimensional joy. And I feel it is the case that we're multidimensional and the reason people suffer is because they look at themselves from one angle and stop considering that they could look at their self in another way. That's it's as easy as that. You know? Your whole life you felt weak. Okay. So what? Like what can you do? What can you do about it? The good thing about sometimes losing in life is that your own the only thing left is to win. So it's like any time the person fails, they just have to uh, it's time to celebrate your failures. Because you just found the blueprint to the success. You just got welcomed by the soul of that art form. Quite speaking. Without uh, uh, honesty, the search for meaning becomes an abomination, conceptual, subjective abomination. The path of intellect, if it's only intellect, if you're trying to like just calculate your way towards liberation, the Sufis would say if you're trying to solve this planet like an equation, it's kind of like whipping a dead donkey and expecting it to run faster. You have made the analysis and the meaning of the world lifeless by considering it as an image. That means, have you noticed, if you look at this in human psychology, if you see two people speaking uh, uh, 
behind someone's back and suddenly that person coming in the room and those two people suddenly acting friendly as if they weren't saying something behind that person's back. You know, this is because the, the, the talking about something is not the same as experiencing that thing actually there. The intensities are different. It's, you know, so I can I can think of the design of a of like right now I'm looking at my yard and I could imagine I don't know, let's say a, a canoe, a, a tribal canoe from back in the day just slowly hovering in the air and moving, you know, past the fence of my place to the neighbors. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? I could visualize that. I could see the design, but I can't experience that canoe. If a canoe suddenly appeared out of nowhere, I would be like, oh my God, you know? The canoe gods have spoken. So guys, let's let's get back to the idea of opening the wings of vision. So far, I've spoken about a personal approach to it and an impersonal. Uh, life can be perceived in various modes, various... Uh, uh, so, so what is happening is that an existential landscape is simulating an experiential landscape where an attributeless witness decides through the... the world inside them, through the linguistic world, the movement of the uh, existential. That means if you want to know what owns an atom, it is a name. Net language owns matter in our in, in human civilization as far as we've developed as creatures with the languages we speak. You know, I, I, I remember there was this... Um, Biological hardware, linguistic software, unknown music. I would suggest say the mystery of consciousness is like that. And so language is, I don't want to say the imposter, but I feel language is the most uh, important thing to study in this life. A person who understands language uh, understands how knowledge breathes, understands how human beings uh, compiled events in this world as uh, uh, numinous events on paper. You know what's fascinating? If you consider life to be a relationship of self and world, a self in a world, and, and in front of your eyes you're a self in a world, behind your eyes you're a world in a self. This is why I'm saying the attention is your location.
your attention is beyond form. It is so beyond form, it sees the space before form emerges. It notices the emptiness before the fullness. You know, I feel we need a new definition for soul. Uh, a more uh, universal definition. Uh, sorry, not universal culture, more of a culturally specific definition. I feel the soul. can be said to be <clears throat> an attributeless attention. It's attention just being before you do anything. That's your presence. At any time, right now, you, you can look at any object around you that is still. If you're at a table, look at the objects at the table. If you're outside, look at the trees, look at the nature, look at phenomena just being. You see how you're noticing being? That is your mind field. That is the field of where the, uh, uh, the field of activity of the uh, right now. You're saying you're saying you're someone, and you know you know something, right? So it's like wondering who is knowing it, and what was the situation prior to storylines, prior to uh, uh, bedtime stories becoming our truths, you know? <laughs> you know, it's like trying to find the rationality of why an instrument fell and it made a noise as it fell. So many things in this life, they are not rational. They are just events, which we, as we observe the event, uh, 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 project dimensions and, uh, and models to perceive the idea through. You know, the cool thing about language is that it, it can be used as an advanced technology. For most people, though, it's a heavy backpack. But if people realize language is an Iron Man suit, and even in your inner realms, geometry becomes the next level Iron Man suit, you can move, you, you, you can experience yourself as a pure geometrical uh, phenomenon. That means right now, just like I could look at my body you know, I could look at my hand and at the same time I could visualize atoms. Do you see? I can also visualize geometrical abstractions. So I would say science, because it engages with the numerical language, is synonymous with geometrical. It's, it, it has geometrical explanatory power. You know, that means when the, the scientific mind uh, is like is like a person in a forest uh the, the hunter gatherer back in the day with better tools who had the discretion of even using the tool <clears throat> so when we look at science we see that it is uh it's very geometrical the whole like uh <clears throat> if you're an astrophysicist listening to this your whole life is geometry it's like have you not noticed <laughs> <clears throat> So, geometry is the soul of language. Wow. Geometry is the soul of language. Definitely, I'm going to be talking about this.
I would say is geometry is the mind of language. Attention is the soul of all existential phenomena. That means you might not realize it, but you're an intelligent being aware of the cosmos. It doesn't get as cosmically aware as this. You know, like it, does, it doesn't, like this is as cosmic, uh, this is as much cosmic awareness, you know, <laughs> at our disposal, you know. So technically, you are being a part of nature. And so it's very fascinating because anytime the person goes towards self-inquiry or studies the nature of how their intelligence is happening in the moment, to uh, even build from that. Uh, <clears throat> if you think you're a body, you got to witness the rhythm of your mind. If you think you're a mind, you got to witness the rhythm of your soul. If you think you're a soul, you are the void where the rhythm begins. That means, let's say there is an event happening, and instead of this event being linearized in the way where it's past to present to future, we see the past, present, future as three lines and our life to be a horizontal line through these vertical lines. You know, what does that mean? That means there is, uh, there is, not only is there three points, that means all the dimensions um, um, it's like looking at stuff, it's like stuff looking in space and space looking at stuff. And at some point, the trust of the personality that uh, dissolves into the moment, because trust is really how attention moves beyond an archetype. If you distrust, you will be kept in an archetype. That means most people, your past is defining your future uh, only if you can see just like Einstein did how time was created so everything doesn't happen all at once. Any moment you get an all at once experience of energy, of existence and experience of simultaneity, it's like when the big and the small look at each other, it's like who does that site belong to? Does the macrocosm, should the macrocosm be limited to the microcosm's interpretation of it? Should the microcosm be limited to the macrocosm's interpretation of it, you know? Your mind is a gift, your intelligence, your life is a gift that you have one lifetime to truly open.
this may sound a bit extreme, but on some level, I've had many days where it's not that the person isn't a person, it's just that the person is watching the environment to a degree that the, uh, it's as if you are living for something. When you live for something, that means you don't want to direct your energy. There's no greater way the species can fly. Than caring for how advanced its potential. That means what do you do? What do you do when you're in a moment where you see the potential of something, but you have no idea how the future is going to be? What can you do? You know, for how long? Can a philosopher sit on that stone with his fingers on his chin, fathoming why is all this here? Why is my finger on my chin? <laughs> There's a picture, guys. There's a reason I'm saying that. Let me show you the statue. It's pretty much a statue that is like when people say philosopher. For most people, this image comes to their mind. <laughs> Here's the picture, guys. If you look at the wallpaper, you'll see it. You know what that is? That is a advanced evolutionary creature that is tired of throwing mud. It's tired of just being a meaningless movement. And is choosing to wonder about the direction of this. Anyways, guys, um, I don't know, I feel, I feel I got, a, I crossed off all the imagery I wanted to share. Um, I mean, here's the thing, like, where does human attention go? Let's say right now we're just an unknown attention being aware of known phenomenology okay so um we're like this unknown viewer of a known world now what can we realistically do if we were to treat ourselves as not star stuff but as mind stuff if we were to just entertain as aristotle says it's the sign of an educated mind to entertain an idea without accepting it most people when they hear something they think they have to instantly accept it so they fight it you know they don't realize that it's just uh, a a geometrical expression thrown into there, you know? The day we treat words like art is the day we have truly understood the meaning of poetry as a species. <clears throat> um,
<clears throat> Sorry guys, I had to take care of something. Uh, where was I? Um, while I went to get something, I was uh, I had I got this idea of um, the value of life being an opportunity and uh, in a civilization where its organization is efficient, uh, people would get a sense that chaos is freedom. That means, you know, the worst, uh, worse than uh, not being in a kingdom, or not worse, but I can say like worse than uh, not being a great kingdom is the person thinks they are a great king. Li uh, like, let me tell you what I mean by that. Um, I'm just saying these, we are 8 billion creatures on a sphere. Uh, if we've had a, so a, a system of society a civilization where it's telling itself we're advanced, we're, we're progressed, we're civilized, but then there's still all this messed up stuff going on on the earth, then it's a delusional civilization. I would say civilization 1.0's uh, self-proclaimed progress is delusional. And that globalization is the most efficient strategy. It's really, there's no choice. I mean, unless we build sky cities, you know. <clears throat> Imagine a future where there's different sky cities and, you know, different nations or just different giant level spaceships. Or whatever. These human beings on the sphere, they would be limited to their performance. That means, tr think of the human being as a battery, you know, a sort of organized, a sort of packet of energy, as uh, someone had said. This rabbi, this very, uh, very educated rabbi had said this, that were packets of energy. <clears throat> And he didn't even say it in a religious context, but he just said it were packets of energy. And it was like, yeah, that's what we are. We're just potential. We you right now, to in your inner realms, yes, you're you and your personal life and all that. But when it comes to your outer realms, you're just a potential change. Let me tell you guys, uh, oh man, sorry guys, I'm, I think it's the way I'm, sitting. <clears throat> Hold on. This is, this is the part of the talk that it's getting interesting. I gotta get serious. Hold on.
Okay, guys, let's do this. the puzzle we're trying to solve is the most efficient <coughs> vision or approach that 8 billion biological candles on a pebble in the middle of nowhere can have the most efficient approach of 8 billion evolutionary animals who appear when they look at outside in front of their eyes they perceive others as objects but when they look at themselves in the mirror and they wonder who's staring out they they appear to themselves as a subject as a person as a self as an ego as I thought call it whatever so we're wondering these 8 billion human beings <clears throat> and I'm saying 8 billion because I think it's not there yet, but it's going to get there. And uh, So these 8 billion plus human beings, the most efficient strategy, and what is the point? If we just take the personal dimension into consideration, then you don't really need to care about this life. Just take as much as you can, feel comfortable, and die off. Like that's that's the one route that ma that's a route many people are actually taking. It's scary to actually fathom, but that's one route. The personal. Then there is the impersonal value of the lifetime of the human being. Okay. So the impersonal value is where we have the best chance to uh, 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 break the veil of the collective unconscious. You see, there is something I don't know. And there is something you don't know, but there is something our species doesn't know. And if we can get to that level of an advanced civilization, efficient, collective enough to, to stare at the same thing, stare at the same problem to solve. Do you know what it is? I was thinking, if we had 8 billion people, imagine nobody had work. Just imagine this idea, guys. Imagine, I mean, this is really futuristic, I would say. Not really, but... <laughs> Of course, you know, maybe 50, maybe 70 years away or something. It's 2020 now. Okay, let me see like this. The impersonal meaning of life is the greatest strategy our species has to bypass physical extinction. Now, even if you're a spiritual person hearing my talk, or a religious person hearing my talk, feeling you're, uh, I mean, let's say spiritual, religious person, you, you wouldn't be interested in these talks because you're, uh, you're, um, you, you have sort of uh, experiential allegiance different thought. But anyways, for anyone who thinks that they're more than matter on this planet, you see, even if you don't take care of matter, the matter is a luxury. 
That means right now, let's say there's a 50-50 chance that uh, there's a temporary, we, the being is, I, it could be temporary, coin flip one side of the coin, you know, and the other side of the coin, eternal. Imagine, it's as if, like Alan Watts says, um, it's like going to sleep, it's like wondering about what it's like going to sleep and never waking up, and wondering about what it's like, what it's like to wake up having never gone to sleep. That waking up having never gone to sleep is the eternal coin side, <clears throat> the going to sleep and as if never, you know, having woken up, is the other side of the coin. So if there's a 50-50 chance <clears throat> that this moment could be eternal, an eternal being, temporality is a luxury. It is the, your, the, your, your, your maya, is the Iron Man suit for the Atman. <laughs> Some yogis in, in India are like, no way, he just said that. <laughs> I don't know. What is the value of your breath, dear listener? What is the value of your breath to you and what is its value to your civilization? And anyone who's told you to fear exploration of your own intelligence on this planet they were afraid of their own intelligence you know and of course sometimes it's important to know where the fear is because if it like it their attention is consciousness through the inner realms alertness is how consciousness is aware to the outer realms before the inner realms have moved so think of it this way that sub the subject and the object are okay this is incredible analogy think of the ego as the camera think of what is in front of the camera the, the uh, actors the event whatever the world <clears throat> that to be the object so a uh, subject is the camera o object is what's in front of the camera and what is looking through the camera is neither the camera nor what's in front of it yet exists in that moment to record that moment. That means I find it hilarious that so many people, even from a religious context, they say everything is God's will, then they feel that they have to take any action. Because the moment everything is God's will, that means your likes and dislikes are also God's will. I was like, why is it that like it's like when that person punched that other person in the face in that street fight in that YouTube video, was that God's will? Was God punching itself in the face? Like what was the point of that? And I realized man has attempted to comprehend God's will and in his in, uh, incapability has bounced off towards la a linguistic conceptual point. Because for me, I was so, when I was seeing, you see, it's like um, you, when you realize you're neither an object or a subject, but these are what the elements of conscious living that are moving. <clears throat> I don't know. Does your, do you feel you as a human being who have, you experience every day once and every day happens once and you go to the next day and life just is, is like one performance? Honestly, I feel like uh, on some people feel like it's hilarious but uh <laughs> i have like even though I've, I've i've given fragment talks but i feel my mind has been talking from the beginning i feel the moment the doctor slapped me when i was born and my lungs began working as an infant do you know <clears throat> that was the moment where I began my talk and my talk hasn't ended. That means these Mr. Within talks, these are fragments. My, uh, my final talk is it's where, uh, where my breath goes. How my attention chooses to uh, eject from the plane of existence or <clears throat> pilot onwards, I don't know. All I know that is there will come a great transformation and every person who thought was an artist 
it's kind of hilarious. You're going to realize a, an artist is not something someone is, someone isn't. Artist, you are nature's art, artwork. And seldom is this said, but art is endurance of expression. <clears throat> if you just understand the idea that it's like you as a human being, whatever you do right now, let's say you do it and you see someone else has done it. Okay? Then, if you keep doing, if you keep asking a question, you will eventually see dimensions to that question you hadn't seen before. And so it's really fascinating because our experience is oscillating between our experiences like an uh, is like the light in the room on off on off awake sleep awake sleep awake sleep awake sleep you know but existentially the room is the room you think the room gives a shit if the light is on or off <laughs> the walls of the room you think care you know <laughs> The space in the room, you think, here, that's the thing. That means I thought, what if man is so infinitesimal that God doesn't even notice man's complaint? You know, of course, these are, these, these are just uh, language after some point becomes geometry. I'm not joking. Geometry is at the core of everything. You look inside a snowflake, it's there. You look inside the uh, particles, it's there. You look inside of language, there's there. Everything in this life if you are a viewer, conscious, if you arise as consciousness, has to do with design. Your biological program, your physical survival in this existence, in this place, random place we've opened our eyes, you know, it depends on how aware you are of how the design of the biological system is occurring. And imagine a civilization that had no blind spots. Imagine we got that advance. Imagine a civilization that mistakes weren't shunned, but they were shunned if the person did not learn from it, if the person did not uh, communicate about it. That means I feel that, um, <clears throat> I don't know, human psychology, we, you, if you want to look at savageness, like if somebody, if people think violence is cool, no. Violence is super old school. It's just like everything was violent. The civility is the upgrade. The space to see the new is the upgrade. Man being able to be conscious that he's man is, is, is the miracle. I'm like, you telling me, you know, after four billion years, atoms became a subject to themselves? It's like, holy fuck. <laughs> <laughs> the difference between uh, those people who think they are an artist and those people who think they are not is that some people have understood to communicate and think through images. Many people are waiting for life to bring the images. You know, that means though I would say this is the one of the most enlightening things you as a human being can do. Get a piece of paper get a pen, you know, or if you don't have that, let's say you only have a dry erase marker, go find a window or a mirror or something. And I want you to just draw meaningless lines. Draw so many meaningless lines on that paper until you understand the value of what it, what it means to draw an actual line. You know, life is kind of like you're, you're move, you move around unconsciously. It's like, how long can you stumble? That is the question. And also to be or not to be, but I would say this is more. <laughs> we are eight billion cameras, and the best thing a camera can do is to share its film. A camera exists for that mere reason. Because if the camera could just record and it could not be transferred to the file, it's as if what meaning is that? Technology has changed and once in a, a once in every moment event, 
into a narrative. And it's very complex to think about evolution, guys, because you can't tell how intelligent the field was. That means the creature was, uh, 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 like right now, you are a, a complexity of atoms. And this complexity of atoms is governed by uh, wavering in the moment, hovering in the moment, attention, a presence, and this presence is the precondition to any sort of relationship with the world. That means if you're not aware of yourself, you're not aware of your world. And if you, especially, I mean now the site is not that necessary, but in the future if we find a way to access multidimensional travel, the most terrifying thing is to lose yourself in a world that you're not from. And that's also important. I feel if, if patience, they said it's a virtue, it's not just a virtue. If the person is observant and truly understands the meaning of concentration and what it means, attention, you fail if there is someone to fail. You succeed if there is someone to succeed. If you can authorize your greater life to yourself before you live it in a way where it's not that your life is a calculated event where you can plan for all of it but rather it's an adventure in an unknown uncharted territory you know we know some things about matter we know some things about the mind but we don't know that much you know and when human beings realize this on a massive level we will become responsible we just like how Uncle Ben in that scene from Spider-Man was like, like that's a mystical thing to say, like, you know, the last words of Uncle Ben to Spider-Man, which was like, with great power comes great responsibility, where guess what, with great evolutionary power, which we are the most advanced species on this planet, <clears throat> there comes great responsibility. There comes a great ability to respond to roar while you're alive. What else is the meaning of life? It's, an, it's a performance, you know, and people are suffering from how they are choosing to see themselves as an actor. You know, the act, you see there's a difference between the, the uh, I would say the advanced actor, I'm speaking in a filmmaking context, a, an advanced actor and an actor that is uh, uncertain of themselves. The advanced actor is not only certain of themselves, they're not aware of the nature of language and phenomenology and everything. They can instantly navigate into a different ideological body. That's what acting is. That's what theater is. It is a, a being possessed by the reality of a subjective context. So the advanced actor, like as a, as a director, I would say like the advanced actor is the one actor who, when you are talking to, to that actor as the director, is listening like an eagle. And when they are in front of the camera, everybody is watching the eagle. Nobody is watching. That means you want um, uh, something from the inner realms of that person bringing that character to life, you know? I mean, of course, I, I haven't had that much of an extensive relationship with working with that many actors, one of the few actors that I've been... Um, I've had an opportunity to work with. It's been... Um, You just want to see what your uh, the unknown in your inner realms has to offer. There's nothing more uh, honorable 
than not fearing your own vision as a human being. That is the greatest thing you can do. And regardless where you are, move, pilot it to simpler levels. Let's say if you're someone who suddenly is in a very messed up situation, what does that mean? That means you're in a complex environment, your inner realms, quickly think about the simple. Think about what is the simplicity in the environment. There's a quote from Sun Tzu. It's incredible, I'm gonna read it for you. Here's the quote, guys. Sun Tzu, um, who was this Chinese general who wrote this book called The Art of War, which is has had as has been a, a historic bestseller, I can say. Throughout history, many human beings have acknowledged this work. In it, there's a saying where it says, Victory, listen to this, guys. Victory comes from finding opportunities and problems. The opportunity of defeating the enemy is provided by the enemy himself. Now, instead of enemy, let's just call it problem. It could be any problem, mathematical, non-mathematical, you know, any, any kind of problem, you know? So, the opportunity of solving the problem is prov provided by the problem itself. That's another way I'm interpreting this. Here, I'm going to share it in case. Here, this is the quote, guys. Feel free to share this in social media. Where is this? One? You know, I feel all of life is the fool's journey to see beyond itself. People have to evoke uh, their own significance to themselves, and I don't know how this happens. I think usually you have a you experience something in life and you snap into it. You suddenly like adjust to it you notice it you know like the term self-realization it, it means something is there you're just noticing you're just realizing the nature of the self this you think the self doubts itself Imagine uh, in the future, I've written this in uh, one of my science fiction narratives, where people, they don't have phones anymore, technology is not uh, connected to your body, and e or even in your brain, let's say, you know? At most, I envision the sort of liquid, that sort of drink that people in the future may drink, and it changes their electromagnetic field so they can instantly access uh, a cyber mind you know I had that sort of vision but the whole idea was that there's this small sphere like a golf ball size or you know I think that's decent golf ball size uh, I mean I let's say tennis ball size okay imagine there's a tennis okay golf ball size imagine there's a the golf ball size would be the new model <laughs> let's say there is a golf ball above your head, which is this incredibly advanced surveillance drone. Do you know? This advanced surveillance drone. That means every human being, AI, it becomes their guardian angel. Do you know? That makes a civilization so safe 
uh, if in this sci-fi setting, I assume, uh, in the sense that even young children can walk wherever they want because that drone is the eyes of the guardian of the of of that of, of the person. So what I mean by that is it's it's like recording everything. You know, that means that's isn't don't you feel <clears throat> women walking late at night will feel safer if they had a drone above their head, a visible drone that was. Uh, not only lighting up a way or something, but like the drone was uh, uh, um, assisting the person in the sense that it was being an in uh, intense surveillance of their life. That's the thing. There's many blind spots that there there is in biological human being which we need technology for, you know. But at the same time, just this experience that. Uh, there is something uh, outside, a view outside uh, the self, observing the self. I mean, honestly, uh, how many people feel the idea of the mind is strangely very resembles a lot the idea of God? Just to think about it, that out of nowhere, an idea of self appears. You know that every year you blow let's say <clears throat> I don't know birthday candles only to realize how could you change if you're the same person you know the inner realms and the outer realms are different and when we learn to discover our own inner realms your inner realms may appear totally different you know you might be a person who like suddenly you might like classical music and you, when you listen to classical music, your inner event, your inner realms become like a time travel machine or something, you know. So, so people are different. You just have to see who you are. The thing is that I even advise people sometimes in your life, just not not even as a meditation, just certain moments. Close your eyes and study the design of your memories. It's like you're like, all right, I'm someone who, who let me remember years ago and then try to ask yourself how accurate are you remembering you know and so you'll eventually notice your inner realms and how they are a different movement than the outer realms now if the outer realms moves first the inner realms are the effect of the outer realms if the inner realms move first the outer realms is the effect of the inner realms that means um, based on the speed of mind uh, of of inner of based on uh, the the mind, the speed of the mind, the speed of mind and the speed of matter. Based on their speed, which one's faster, there is different ways that reality can be conceived. We can feel that all physical existence is the imagination of something non-physical. You know, just like how I suddenly had said these words suddenly suddenly a universe popped up you know so 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 it, it's like there can be mysteries that make us <clears throat> wonder about you know metaphysics and ontology you know? how our eyes open in the spirit that is that is the most fascinating question even when i see people people are not to me but belief system you know people are agents change agents of of conscious change it's like it's like you know who got here before us like before i was giving a talk the atoms were given a talk poetically speaking what i mean by that is matter was moving before the belief that matter extracted uh, upon itself attributes. The mystery of consciousness is the most fascinating thing and now it's a mystery. Do you know how many we are so blessed people don't realize the value of philosophy is the value of how far the eyes of the species is. That's, re that's the true value of philosophy. You know this, this picture you see of the thinking man statue? <clears throat> This man is wondering 
about where else can attention go. And anytime you wonder about the nature of your attention, uh, it's like when you step inside the house, you see the interior design of the house. When you step outside of the house, you either have seen the interior design or you might feel a deja vu, but you'll see the outer design is the purpose. So based on which side of the coin you think you are on, you may feel like, I don't know, you may feel your mind's eternal, your body's temporary. You may feel atoms, etern ele the elements like atoms don't die, but man does. For me, I, like I always think about it, you know, that what my last moment in this plane of existence would be like. And honestly, I could see it would be my last effort to bow. To bow to uh, every form that the eyes exist in. Reality is we are living in a film and behind our eyes we are the director of a film. That means humanities, we can say poetically, humanity is Gaia's attempt to see beyond itself in the atmosphere. Right now, we may be, yeah, it's all for humanity, but like the planet is like, guys, I'm here. <laughs> so, anyways, thanks for tuning in, guys. Um, I'm going to open it up to five minute QA and I'm going to share a Discord link for those in interested to engage. And the talk component has ended for this, so thanks for tuning in. I hope. Um, the linguistic artwork was uh, visible. Okay. sounds that have come like you know from the environment into the talk people are like Mr. Lippen, are you giving this talk at the edge of a highway <laughs> one side of the highway there's trees the other side of it is like you know. <laughs> anyways guys I've shared the discord link and uh, if anyone has questions feel free to ask you know usually I'm such a great speaker nobody has questions <laughs> Stretch the soul.